Hi, gentle and of course very modern apes. This video is a re-release, a re-upload, an update, if you will, of a video that I created last year titled The Bogus Creationism of Jeffrey Tompkins. It's so sick and twisted, and I feel so violated. Months after the video released, a different young earth creationist responded to that video and pointed out a few errors that I had made in it. Now, they didn't impact the conclusion of the video at all. In fact, the creationist who pointed them out actually agreed with me that Jeffrey Tompkins' methods do not actually work. And I agree with you on some of the most important parts. But that being said, I feel it is my responsibility to re-release the video with the errors corrected. I outline the errors in this video here, and I really think you should check that video out because what it does is it details my journey through finding out about these errors and investigating them. And well, would you believe me if I told you that they make the entire Jeffrey Tompkins situation even worse? How? Hold on, bro. How? I know that's like a meme or whatever, like a way to save face where you're like, yeah, I made these mistakes, but in actuality, they made me even more right. But I'm not joking when I say I did make mistakes and those mistakes revealed that I am even more right in my criticism of Jeffrey Tompkins and my accusation that he is either being deceptive or he is incompetent as a geneticist. A lot of my old video was just fine, was correct, and honestly, I really like how it was edited. So I'm wearing the same shirt as I wore in that video and I'm going to be kind of creating a hybrid video here where the good and correct parts of the old video are included, but there's also a boatload of new content. It's actually kind of like that new Scott Pilgrim anime where we keep some of the stuff that worked from the original, but there's also new things. Like, comment, and subscribe if you like pop culture references like that. The integration of the two videos is going to be seamless. You won't even be able to tell, but I have linked the old video, which is now unlisted in the description because one, I don't want anybody to think I'm trying to scrub my mistakes from the internet. And two, I think it's important to document how people change their mind and how opinions evolve. And honestly, I couldn't be more more excited because what we're going to be doing today is systematically annihilating one of the most scientifically bankrupt claims made in young earth creationism that humans are only about 80% similar in our DNA to chimpanzees made by a one Jeffrey Tompkins. I found out that the human and chimpanzee genomes were no more than 85% similar. Now at this point you might be thinking, whoa, guts a given, you're coming in a little hot here. This is pretty aggressive right off the bat. And that's not the guts a given, the Erica that I'm used to, the one who's typically cordial and tries to give people the benefit of the doubt. Uh, this mean Erica is not the one I like so much. And what I would say to you with regard to that is you're right. I dislike Jeffrey Tompkins. I've read just about everything this man has ever put out with relation to the topic at hand today. And I think there's a bit of mischief afoot here. And you know how I feel about mischief in science. I hate it. Tom Foolery belongs on the playground, not in the lab, and certainly not in your supposedly peer-reviewed papers, as well as the number that hundreds, if not thousands, of creationists cite on the regular. Humans are only 80% similar to chimpanzees genomically. If you've been hopping around the debunking young earth creationism scene for any modicum of time, you've probably heard this quip before. And you could also probably stand to develop some healthier hobbies. Of course, you know, stones and glass houses. What? I love garbage. Regardless of our mutual bad taste in pastimes, I'm sure you've heard that quote before, and I've heard it more times than I can count. It is parroted by just about every Young Earth creationist organization out there. Answers in Genesis, Creation Ministries International, the Institute for Creation Research, and of course the oodles and oodles and oodles of devout followers of these organizations, your layman creationists, also love to spew it. Based on new data in 2018, researchers have now shown that the maximum human and chimp DNA similarity is actually only 84%. Even if you've heard it, so what? You might be thinking, who cares? What is the actual significance of this 80% number? What does it mean? 
Well, before we meticulously deconstruct this portion of Jeffrey Tompkins' career, you need a little bit of background, okay? So strap in. We humans are apes. We are members of the superfamily Hominoidea and the family Hominidae. This means we are specifically great apes. The reason humans are classified this way is because we have all of the physical characteristics that designate our position with the other apes. Like them, we have internal tails, highly mobile shoulders, a Y5 molar pattern, dexterous hands and wrists, long gestations and long developmental periods, complex social systems, and large brains for our body sizes. We have all the same bones, muscles, and organs, and even our brains have all the same regions, with humans merely emphasizing portions related to cognition. This is why, although all great apes use tools, human tools are the most sophisticated. The difference between humans and other apes is one of degree, not kind. Get it? The fact that humans are so closely aligned with the other apes has actually been recognized for centuries, if not millennia. Linnaeus, the father of taxonomy and a creationist himself, even recognized this, choosing to elevate the other apes to our level rather than separate us out. Darwin fleshed this idea out, of course, and after decades of intense scrutiny, there can be no denying that humans are physically apes just as dogs are physically canines. But even with that understanding, it was thought that humans were a very distinct ape indeed. We thought ourselves an outlier. Apes, if barely. And then along came genetics. Now, while everyone appreciated that humans were probably going to hash out as being closest to the apes, what no one really expected was how close we ended up being. And the final family tree was surprising to many. The human genome was sequenced in 2002 and the chimpanzee genome three years later in 2005. This allowed comparisons to be made in full rather than the shorter sections of the genomes that were being compared before, and the results were striking. In coding base pairs, that is, the regions of the genome that code for proteins, humans and chimpanzees were 98.8% similar. When indels were included, so a full genome-to-genome -genome comparison, that number hashed out to be 96%. This is why you can get a couple of different numbers for the question how similar genomically are humans and chimpanzees. We're nearly 99% similar if we're only comparing coding base pairs within the genome, and we're around 95 to 96% similar when we're looking at the full genome with indels included. The fact that there are differing numbers isn't because people and scientists are changing their mind, it's because it depends on what we're actually comparing. What can be said for certain, though, is that the number is really high. In fact, humans and chimps are more similar genomically than African and Asian elephants are to one another. And not only that, but as more apes were sequenced, it came to be seen that humans aren't just most closely related to chimpanzees, but that chimpanzees are also most closely related to humans. This means that your genome, the individual watching this, has more in common with a random chimpanzee genome than any gorilla on the planet shares with that random chimp. The closest relative to humans and chimps as a pair is then gorillas, followed by orangutans, and then the gibbons. This comparative genomics work is effectively a souped-up version of a paternity test. The genome reveals how close two organisms or two species are, and humans are closest to panins, placing us not just with the other apes, but smack dab in the middle of the family hominidae. Firmly apes past the bananas. Creationists went absolutely ballistic at this. And this is because according to certain, and in my opinion, myopic and incorrect interpretations of Genesis, the sort of Abrahamic God created humans literally in his image out of nothing around 6,000 years ago at the end of a sort of five day smorgasbord of creating things from like dirt and literally out of thin air. Cringe. But as I'm sure you can understand, it's very difficult to accept human evolution and common descent if you have this particular starting point as it were. Many, in fact most, Christians and other religious folks make it work, creationists do not. And so, after the human-chimp genomic similarity number was published around 2005, creationists suited up for several decades of unimaginative whinging. Because if humans are created in the literal image of God, why monkey? The number simply must be wrong somehow. First, they complained that the entire human genome and the entire chimpanzee genome weren't being compared. And this was actually true. When the human genome was officially sequenced, it wasn't 
actually completely sequenced. Known functional regions were, along with much of the majority functionless rest of the genome, the same thing happened with the chimpanzee genome. So when the comparison was made, functional regions were the focus since the entirety of these areas were complete and the rest of the genome was not known to have any explicit function. This is still generally the case, despite the fact that creationists will tell you the entire genome has been shown to be functional or we're moving towards the entire genome being shown to be functional. This is not true. The genome has enormous portions of it that are non-functional, and we know this thanks to knockout tests. You can take a mouse, knock out large portions of its genome, and it can still reproduce and have offspring and live a long life, and then it will die. And this is because the regions that are being knocked out don't do anything. No ENCODES work doesn't change this. You can see a video here by Dan of Creation Myths to explain in depth why. However, in the meantime, and when I say in the meantime, I mean just the past like two or three years, the human genome has finally been completely sequenced. The chimpanzee genome isn't there yet, although a significantly larger portion of it is now known. And wouldn't you know it, the similarity between humans and chimps has actually gone up a little bit, not down. So then they claimed that the chimpanzee genome was actually biased in favor of the human genome, like it was artificially inflated because it had used the human genome as sort of a reference during its assembly. And there is some truth to that. The sort of humanization of some of these early great ape genomes is appreciated by the genetics community, as it were. And so what the genetics community did is they just were like, yeah, that's reasonable. Let's investigate it a little bit. And so they just assembled the great ape genome, specifically the chimp, without using the human scaffolds, like the human reference. And uh, what they found is that the similarity stayed the same. For reference, we'll be using one of those non-humanized great ape genomes today. We're going to be using Pantro 6. So at this point, the creationists kind of split into two camps of cope. And the first of those camps is going to be the one that the intelligent design advocates and the old earthers join. And this is basically an acceptance of the number, that high similarity, with the stalwart caveat that it is due to common design, not common descent. Okay. Clever, you might muse. After all, a Honda and a Subaru SUV certainly share a lot of similarities, but it doesn't mean one literally descended from the other. They just share a lot because they perform similar functions. My brother in Christ, those are cars. Cars don't reproduce, and they don't pass down genetic information, the through line of which literally connects organisms in an ancestor-descendant relationship. But common design gets cratered as an argument by one simple observation in genetics, and that's that we see nested hierarchies formed not just by functional regions of the genome, but also by non-functional regions of the genome. It's one thing to argue common design on the basis of similar functions or similar morphologies. After all, these are reflected in the genome, and so it would be reasonable to suppose that if two organisms look similar, their genes should reflect that, and that could be due to common design. The problem with it is we have regions of the genome that do nothing at all. And those also form nested hierarchies. It's going to be very difficult to argue at this point common design without supposing that God just kind of is trolling people by creating the, the appearance of evolution in every facet of an organism's genome, but actually it wasn't evolution, it was him all along. God just likes messing with people, and specifically creationists, who are supposed to be like his favorite guys. I thought it would be funny. A young Earth creationist, faced with the continued validation of the high human chimp genomic similarity, simply said that the number still wasn't right. And by they, I mean Jeffrey Tompkins. Jeff did that. Who is Jeffrey Tompkins, you might be wondering? Well, he's today's goofy antagonist, and he is perhaps one of my least favorite young Earth creationists. You know what? I am not as mean as I would like to be. And I really wish people appreciated that more. Jeffrey Tompkins is a geneticist, so perfect background for not making rudimentary mistakes in the field of genetics. Tompkins got his master's in plant science from the University of Idaho in 1990, and then got his PhD in genetics from Clemson in 1996. So now, like I said, humans and chimpanzees, genomically speaking, are about 98.8% similar when looking at coding base pairs, and when including indels, so basically whole genome comparison, that number's about 96%. And Jeff 
is the maddest individual on the planet at this number. At that point, I realized there was some monkey business going on um, with chimpanzee DNA right. <laughs> research comparing it to human. So much so that he has written numerous papers on the subject along with a book. It's a picture book, but it's still a book. He's evidently devoted much of his career as a young earth creationist scientist to debunking this number. He converted in his undergrad, and I guess he's been milling away at this. Some of the first stuff comes out around 2011, so a long, long time. He hates it. So while other creationists simply look at the number and they're like, it's common design, or there's another explanation for it. And again, I have my problems with those explanations as well. Tompkins just seethes and kicks his feet and says, it's not true. <coughs> Even other young earth creationists know better than this. Todd Wood, who I love to uh, gas up on this channel, is a young earth creationist and he looks at the number and he's like, yeah, he's even published in young earth creationist circles that guys, like the number is legit. We're just gonna have to deal with it. Not Jeff though. So, if humans aren't 96 to 98.8% similar, how similar are they according to Jeffrey Tompkins? Well, it depends on when you ask him the question and what methodology he's using, because I've heard everything from 70 to 89%, and it's all bullshit. I try my best not to swear on this channel. I like keeping things mostly professional, even if I am being sassy or including jokes in my videos, uh, but there's really no other way to put it. It is the only word that accurately encompasses how I feel about the body of work that Jeffrey Tompkins has put out. And I wanna take you on a journey as to why. Now, I'm a primatologist. I got my master's of research in primatology and my bachelor's was in animal science, specifically pre-professional animal science. So I was on the pre-vet track. I took a lot of STEM courses, Chem 1 and Chem 2 inorganic, Chem 1 and Chem 2 organic, Physics 1 and 2, Biochemistry, and of course, Genetics. But I am not a geneticist. I am genetics adjacent at best. But then, I'm not trying to debunk comparative genomics, am I? I'm at least qualified to take a look at the number and the work surrounding it. And what I think you'll find is that you don't need to be a geneticist to show why Jeffrey Tompkins' work is bogus. That is not good. In fact, by the end of this, I think you'll have a pretty good idea as to how to run this stuff for yourself. So you can kind of cross check me and cross check Jeff. Creationist Rob Carter actually did do that with my last video and pointed out some mistakes that I made. He also agreed with me that Jeffrey Tompkins' methods do not work. However, this time I want to make it easy. So you will find a GitHub link in the description that should hopefully help you recapitulate everything I've done here for yourself and make your own judgments. Hi, I'm Luke, aka Mr. Gibbon. I'm a professional software developer and I helped Erica put together the Blast tool. You can find it on GitHub at this link. <laughs> yeah, so we, we put together the tool pretty quickly. Um, it's just kind of thrown together. So if any of that is bad, that's, uh, that's not my problem. Um, I don't know anything about genetics, so probably about the same level as everyone else involved. There may be some bugs in there. There might be problems. Uh, I don't think there are that many at least. Hopefully, uh, but it should be pretty good either way. So check it out. Um, if you do find any bugs, please report them. Um, you can open an issue on GitHub or if you have any problems installing or anything like that, please uh, let us know and we'll try to update the instructions. It should all be in the readme though. You should also find the link to a write-up in the description that has all of the content from this video, but none of the funny jokes for those of you out there who very much dislike when people have a good time, but who nevertheless want to see why Jeffrey Tompkins is incorrect. This is a dissection of the majority of a body of work concerning a specific topic by one guy. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through his papers. We are going to look at his methodology. We're going to compare it to normal comparative genomics, and we are going to run some tests 
for ourselves. For us, this journey begins in 2011. One of Jeffrey Tompkins' first published works on the difference between humans and chimpanzees was the paper titled Genome-Wide DNA Alignment Similarity Identity for 40,000 Chimpanzee DNA Sequences Queried Against the Human Genome is 86 to 89%. You should know before we begin that all of Jeffrey Tompkins' publications with regard to this subject were published in the Answers Research Journal, which is the Young Earth Creationist Organization Answers in Genesis' journal that has no secular peer review and requires a Young Earth Creationist perspective. This piece was evidently put out in part as a response to Todd Wood, the much cooler Young Earth creationist I mentioned earlier, who agreed that humans and chimpanzees do indeed hash out to be 96 to 98.8% similar when he ran some of these contiguous sequences himself. So Jeffrey Tompkins maybe perhaps was triggered by this and that's what caused him to just enter the fray on this subject, because remember there's nothing that makes a creationist angrier than another creationist agreeing with conventional science. So look out, Rob Carter, you might have kicked a hornet's nest by agreeing with me. So, allow me to stop and explain a few things that are going to be very relevant for understanding the rest of the video and the significance of the work that I did. First, comparative genomics is the study of how entire genomes differ from one another. This can be done within a species, such as taking two humans for, say, a paternity test, or between species to determine how similar, closely related, they are. It is the same logic in both ways. This is rooted in pretty basic concepts. Genetic information is inherited from parent to offspring. Thus, organisms with more similar genomes are more closely related. As an aside, this is just another reason as to why common design fails so utterly as a scientific concept. It cannot readily distinguish what it accepts as common descent, such as dogs coming from wolves, and what it desperately needs to be common design, such as the similarity between humans and chimps. Corporate needs you to find the differences between this picture and this picture. Intel has told us there are at least seven. Okay, I already see one. Give me. Okay. They're the same picture. And then again, we have that nested hierarchy problem with functional versus non-functional DNA, but we already talked about that. Now, there are many ways to actually compare genomes. There are plenty of different tools, both downloadable and web browser based out there if you wanna try some of this stuff for yourself. But Tomkins in this 2011 paper uses a tool called BLAST. BLAST stands for Basic Local Alignment Search Tool and is used to find regions of similarity in genetic sequences. A sequence is just a string of base pairs, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine for DNA, which is what we're concerned with for today. These are abbreviated as A's, T's, C's, and G's. BLAST works in a pretty intuitive fashion, using a heuristic algorithm to match queries to a known database. So if I'm comparing a sequence in human chromosome 1, my query, to chimp chromosome 1, my database, BLAST will break my query into words. These words are smaller pieces of my query that serve to act as minimum matches before BLAST tries to align the full query to chimp chromosome 1 sequence. The whole database will be searched, and in the end, BLAST will spit out a list of the closest comparisons ranked by similarity. By the nature of this comparison, extremely short sequences will return many more identical matches that are ultimately kind of uninformative. There are probably untold numbers of ATA strings in the human genome matching to the chimp genome, for instance. But longer sequences aren't exactly perfect either. If we have a sequence of 100 base pairs with an insertion at base pair 50, should BLAST say that these two sequences are 99% similar or 50% similar? This is why BLAST has additional parameters that can allow it to ignore small differences and continue running comparisons if the operator desires. One such example is the gapped versus ungapped parameter, which not surprisingly controls whether gaps are allowed in the alignment. Gapped alignments can take insertions and deletions into account while ungapped alignments cannot, but are much faster for it. Fortunately, the BLAST algorithm is pretty clever, so even though this is what's going on in the alignment, the output is going to be a bit different. BLAST is still going to give that 90% for the gapped alignment, but for ungapped, you're actually going to get two smaller, highly similar alignments with that gap not being incorporated at all. 
What this means is that typically gapped is going to be used for whole genome alignments, while ungapped is going to be utilized if you don't want to include any indels. This also effectively means that the search for the uh, protein coding human chimpanzee genomic similarity was an ungapped search, while the whole genome was probably a gapped search. So to make a huge generalization, ungapped is typically used when you're comparing highly similar regions, while gapped is better for full genomic comparisons between two organisms, whether you're looking at within a species or between a species, because it can handle all of the differences. This goes for dogs versus wolves, and it goes for humans versus chimps as well. Both of these comparisons would utilize the gapped parameter. The gapped versus ungapped distinction is a very important one with regard to BLAST, because it can have very severe consequences if you end up using the wrong parameter for a certain analysis. Let me show you what I mean. We're going to be using an example from a paper that was written by a friend of the channel who for the time being will remain nameless, but I want to show what their paper looks like because it's going to come up again later. The ungap parameter determines whether to account for small indels in the comparison. Indel is a portmanteau of the words insertion and deletion, and it refers to insertion and deletion events that can occur in the genome. Insertions refers to when one or more base pairs end up inserted in a place where they weren't previously, and deletion is the opposite. One or more base pairs ends up deleted from where they should be. Suppose we have a nucleotide sequence of 13 base pairs. If the ungap parameter is used and there is a putative single nucleotide insertion in one of the sequences, then the BLAST algorithm cannot continue the alignment. Obviously, the first six nucleotides are identical in this example, but there seems to be an extra A in the query sequence which prevents the alignment from continuing any further. If the BLAST algorithm is unconstrained by the ungapped parameter, and we are using a gapped parameter, it is clever enough to insert a gap into the subject sequence, and that gap represents a putative insertion or deletion. To put things simply, the gapped parameter can handle indels while the ungapped parameter cannot. The ungapped parameter can handle single nucleotide polymorphism, but the second there's an insertion or deletion and the entire sequence is offset by one or more, it's just going to stop the alignment. Let me show you what I mean by using our 13 base pair long sequences again. Let's say these two sequences differ by one nucleotide. A gapped and ungapped analysis will report the same percent similarity, being around 92%. This is a single nucleotide polymorphism, and the sequences are the same length, so no big deal. But let's use our insertion again. The gap parameter will simply add a gap, accrue a penalty, and continue with the alignment. It won't stop until the alignment ends, or we hit the penalty limit, the X-drop score, which defaults at around 20. So allow me to explain penalties and rewards really quickly, just so you have the full picture moving forward. The standard word size for BLAST is 11 letters long, so every alignment will start by trying to match those 11 letters, and once aligned, the process will extend. Using default parameters, each match has a reward of plus 1 points, and each mismatch has a penalty of minus 2 points, with the maximum penalty accumulation being negative 20 at the fall. These penalties and rewards can change at your whim, and the default changes depending on which mechanism within the BLAST program you're actually using, but I hope you at least get the idea. There's only a set amount of mismatches that an alignment can handle before it terminates the alignment and backs everything up before spitting out a percent identity. So for our gapped comparison, the output file is going to report that for a search that is 13 base pairs long, 12 base pairs matched. This is about 92% similar. Ungapped, on the other hand, cannot handle that gap, that indel, and will begin misaligning the sequences. Everything followed is going to be mismatched, and the penalty score of 20 will quickly be reached. BLAST will then report a 100% similarity for those first six base pairs, which is a higher percent similarity than gapped, but a shorter length. Length. So if you want to do a full genomic comparison, you basically have to use gapped or else you're not going to be able to incorporate the indels. The alignment is just going to putter out every single time. And this is why we use the gapped parameter when comparing two species or even two individuals of the same species depending on the locations we are comparing. Another important consideration when using BLAST is the type of genome that we're actually using. Genomes can be published in various ways, but FASTA files are common for BLAST and are easy enough to find. 
So the website you can see in the background is Ensemble, and Ensemble has loads of different published genomes and published chromosomes for different organisms. So if I click on the human here, I go to download FASTA, I click DNA, and what you can see is numerous different options for downloading the full genome versus downloading individual chromosomes. And what you'll see is that you've got mitochondrial DNA, the sex chromosomes, as well as one through 22, and you have these options here, just .DNA, .RM, and .S. So these stand for um, masking, like how this genome is masked. And masking simply refers to how the published genome handles highly repetitive elements. So in a genome that is masked, we're taking those highly repetitive elements and just reducing them to the capital letter N. You're basically blocking them out and you're saying for our considerations today, we're not going to worry about these highly repetitive elements. Um, then you have soft mask, which takes those and they turn them into lowercase. So if I had a bunch of ATA repeats, it would turn them into lowercase ATAs. And then unmasked is exactly what it sounds like. It's a genome that has zero masking. So as you can imagine, the type of masking that you utilize is going to greatly impact the size of the file. So your unmasked and soft masked genomes and genetic material, like your chromosomes and stuff like that, are going to be significantly larger than masked. So for instance, your masked top level and primary assembly, so these are the full human genome are 652 megs and 458 megs respectively. That's pretty big, but the top level and primary assembly for unmasked is one gig versus 840 megs. That's huge. And then if you go to the soft mask, which includes, I guess, additional information because we're dealing with lowercase, it's 1.1 gigs for the top level and 898 megs for the primary primary assembly, which th these are just very large files. And when you're playing around in Ensemble and with Blast, get ready to have like a lot of your space eaten up by genomes. So when using BLAST to compare the genomes of two given species, how might we appropriately pick our genomes and set our parameters? Well, the masking is going to depend specifically on the type of analysis we're running, but we know for sure that we must use the gapped parameter. I mean, at least if you wanted to do a full genomic comparison and not leave out gigantic portions of relatively different genetic material that might be important for coming up with a percent similarity between two organisms, you know, using ungapped might make that a little bit difficult. Not to mention when you use ungapped, it makes it pretty difficult to standardize your sequence length doesn't it? Because you're going to get a lot of random chopping up of sequence queries. There's going to be a challenge there when it comes to coming up with a nice way of weighting the data. That's called foreshadowing. Now that you know how BLAST works, let's get back to Jeffrey Tompkins and his 2011 paper. Okay, so here it is on the Answers Research Journal. If we scroll down past his abstract, because we'll touch on his methods, what he did and what he found in a moment, you can see a section that's titled Creation Reviews and Analysis, or Creationist Reviews and Analysis. And it's in this section that we get our nice uh, little dunk on Todd Wood, uh, especially down here at the bottom where he discusses more recently, Wood presented a human chimp genome-wide comparison paper at the 2011 Creation Biology annual meeting and published a brief abstract of the effort. The effort. Wood indicated that he used the blast -N algorithm to align in pairwise fashion 40,000 random chimp genome sequences against the most recent version of the human genome. Then he goes, details about the algorithm parameters employed or how the data was returned and evaluated were lacking. He apparently used standard default parameters that would have incorporated sequence masking and the compiling of multiple hit data from single query sequences, chimp sequences saying blah, 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 blah. So he goes on to talk and, and kind of um, speculate on whether or not he thought Wood used a specific subset of BLAST called Megablast, and then he explains how he ran a much smaller test and got a lower similarity of 89% using the exact same BLAST parameters, which is kind of weird because again he says he doesn't know the BLAST parameters, but he goes on to say that an attempt was made to repeat a smaller subset of Wood's research using the standard default parameters for BLAST N, word size 11, default gapping, and an E value of 10. Now the default gapping is, is gapped, right? So this is not an ungapped parameter, good stuff, but he says he only had, you know, achieved an 89% similarity. And he says that this was you know, published in Tomkins 2011D. So if we scroll down to his, his references to Tomkins 2011D, uh, you can't access it. 
evaluating the human chimp DNA myth, new research and data. And if you go and search this, it just takes you to an online publication with no real details as to what he actually did and how he performed his study. So I find that curious, but I think I know actually how he got that 89%. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later, but let's move on for the time being. His next section after creationist reviews and analysis is a section that is, to me, humorously titled Genome Comparison, Philosophy and Approach. And after this section, we have the materials and methods, which is down here. Now, for those of you who might not know, when you publish something in the literature, materials and methods are where you say, here's what I did and here's how I did it. Curiously, there's a little bit of that hidden away in this section titled Genome Comparison, Philosophy and Approach. It is cast aside but it cannot hide from us. In Hidden away in this section, we have a quote down here that says, while a majority of the genome is now known to be widely functional, which of course we know is nonsense, but of course that citation is Wells, 2011. This is Jonathan Wells's book. It's called Icons of Evolution, Science or Myth. So we've got a nice unbiased scientist here who's definitely not also employed by, by ICR or one of its many sort of sister organizations. Um, but this, this section is, is sort of Tomkins trying to justify the, the methods that he then turns around and uses. He tells us that he's going to be using unmasked genomes. That's fine. Although it, it did make it a pain in the butt for me to replicate. And he talks about all these grand and multiple tests that he's running with different combinations of word size being seven, 11, and 15. 11 is the default and E value parameters and all sorts of cool stuff like that. He's really letting us in on his, uh, on his thought process here. And then stashed away in what is the second to last paragraph, we get sort of the, the punchline. Given that the genome-wide analysis required a large amount of cumulative and comparative data, only the top alignment for each database hit if it existed was returned. Gapping was disallowed for a variety of reasons. <laughs> You can't get away with that. So, okay, he's using ungapped, which means theoretically he's going to be getting uh, the percent similarity for just the coding regions, no indels, things of that nature. But um, why is it still so low, right? His percent similarity is still in the 80s, which is a lot lower than the conventional number of almost 99%. What else is going on here? I don't want to spoil the other sneaky thing that's going on here, but I'll give you a hint. It has to do with this poorly formatted table that you can see on screen now. For now, let's see what the justification was for using ungapped as a parameter. First, this guy in 1990 determined that the addition of gapping strategies for alignments designed to locate regions of local similarity using BLAST was negligible. Secondly, if an objective comparison among all queries negates the use of gapping with the algorithm. Finally, the top local pairwise alignments that were obtained involved a variety of very liberal to very stringent matching parameters for word sizing E value. None of this matters. None of this means anything. The analysis is kaput because of that ungapped parameter that he utilized. And it was not in the materials and methods section. It was found there, stashed down in the second to last paragraph of the philosophy of his approach. And it's interesting because of course he talks about gapping. So if you control F here for ungapped, you don't get anything. There's nothing returns because he never uses the phrase ungapped despite the fact that that's what the parameter is called. He just says gapping was disallowed, which to me is um, it's a little bit sneaky. That's suspicious. Yeah, that's, that's weird. So the analysis is worthless because of that ungapped parameter and we can move on. You might be thinking to yourself, well, how do we know that it's worthless? And um, we'll get there. We're going to come back to the analysis that he ran in this 2011 study and that little short analysis that he claims that he ran earlier as well, because I have things to say about both, but it'll ruin the punchline early if we talk too much about it now. You can't use ungapped if you want to compare the entire genome, right? Because you need those indels to get a full picture. The reason it's so low, again, pin. I did find out that Jeffrey Tompkins has worked with Nathaniel Jensen in the past, though, so that's kind of funny. 
So I guess people didn't react enough to this piece, or maybe it was the fact that the bonobo genome was published in 2012 and showed that we are just as similar to them as we are to chimpanzees, being 96 to 98.8% similar genomically speaking. But Jeffrey Tomkins decided to take another stab at the human chimp genome similarity in 2013 with this infamous gem, Comprehensive analysis of chimpanzee and human chromosomes reveal average DNA similarity of 70%. This one is just, and I can't wait to tell you why. The methods are in the right place this time, and he uses the published chimpanzee genome, evidently a masked version, since he brings up having to remove the ends. And this chimpanzee reference genome was then compared to the human reference genome by slicing up the chimpanzee material into 100 to 650 base pair sections, depending on the chromosome in question. And the parameters utilized in ungapped comparison again. Are you serious? And I suspect the issue with the table is also rearing its head again, once more making this entire study bunk, because for one, you're using ungapped, so you're not getting the entire genome. And for two, hmm, pin. If you saw that 70%, you might be thinking to yourself, well, that's weird, because he did ungapped earlier and he got 80 to 89%, or 84 to 89%. Why so much lower now? And the reason it turns out is because he was using a bugged version of BLAST. The version of the tool he was actually using was bugged. And this was discovered by a one Glenn Williamson, also known as Ruhif Online, who is a computer programmer. He's also the one that wrote this nice little paper, the excerpt from which we pulled from earlier. And if we scroll to the top, um, it's called Dr. Tompkins Falls Victim to Software Bug in Chimpanzee comparison. So Glenn basically saw Tompkins' 70% number and he was like, this is stupid. Too stupid. There must be an additional flaw in the methodology. And he sussed out what it was. Now, if you're a young earth creationist out there, you might be doing the usual little jig and saying, heh, well, if Glenn Williamson's analysis was so good and Jeffrey Tompkins was so wrong, why didn't Glenn publish his criticisms of Jeffrey Tompkins in the Answers Research Journal itself? And to that I say, dear viewer, he did. Or at least he tried. Glenn Williamson submitted that exact manuscript we were looking at to the Answers Research Journal, remember, a young earth creationist journal, um, and didn't hear anything for a hot minute. So Glenn reached out to Andrew Snelling, one of the main guys working at the ARJ. Now, Andrew Snelling is another young earth creationist, obviously, he's a, a geologist. And this is what he said to Glenn on the status of his submitted paper with regard to the bug in BLAST. Hi Glenn, good day. I'm getting back to you with an update on where things are at. Jeff Tompkins and Nathaniel Jensen have given me a report on the analysis of your paper. They say that the main issue with Glenn's paper is that it is claimed that there is a fault in BLAST N under certain conditions, which don't apply to parameters Jeff used, that no one has proven one way or another. They complain about Glenn's specificity for a moment before saying, they conclude that Williamson's apparent lack of biological training, lack of familiarity with the biological literature, and his inability to analyze and report his own results, it is difficult to see the value in continuing to engage him, let alone give him the platform to air his uninformed and unhelpful views. Then Snelling comes back in with, there you have it. As editor, I accept the report. I agree you should take up the fault you claim to have found with the folks who wrote the code at NCBI. We will therefore not be publishing your paper. Thanks for trying and for being patient. We know you will not take this decision easily, but until such a time as you've contacted the NCBI folks and convinced them there is a problem in their code, which evolutionists also use, we will not consider your paper any further. Cheers, Andrew. Glenn responds, I'm actually not upset. I'm more energized than anything else. This was kind of the fight I was expecting. It all seemed to be going a little too easily up to now. While I go away and do some more work on this, I'd like you and Jeff to think about two things. The first thing that Glenn notes is that BLAST has been in use for 30 years, but there have been bugs in almost every version that are quickly caught and fixed, meaning double checking is at least worth consideration. Then Glenn says, notice the one thing that Dr. Tompkins didn't do was the one thing he could do to dispel the entire paper, referring to Glenn's paper, run his experiment again, but use parameters that can identify the sequences that don't return hits and then blast them manually. It's quite telling that he hasn't done this. I imagine it's because he's terrified of it. I don't give up very easily. I'll be in contact soon. 
Cheers. Snowling responds, Hi Glenn, I never expected you would give up. However, you are wrong in your assertions. Jeff has been and continues to do new runs to test and retest his work. He is still confident in the outcomes and he has had Nathaniel Jensen looking over his shoulder. Furthermore, he has been in contact with the programmers at NCBI and he is fully aware of the code's history and use. Meanwhile, you should do some more homework yourself. Cheers for now, Andrew. The two go back and forth for a while about contacting NCBI before Snelling responds to Glenn and informs him that he has been in contact with Jeffrey Tompkins. Tompkins, it seems, has come around to the idea that there may in fact be a problem with Blast, but proposes, quote, My solution to the whole mess is to publish my own report describing the observed problems with the Blast N algorithm and acknowledging Glenn in it, unquote. Then Snelling comes back in with, so rather than you, quote, shooting, unquote, at Jeff, you should be writing a paper to get published in a bioinformatics journal. Only then will you have established the bugs in the algorithm among these experts, will you be in a position to then establish what the consequences are. Meanwhile, Jeff has promised to publish the results of his own investigations, which you will definitely get to see in due course. This does not rule out a future exchange with Jeff, should that be necessary. You have been persistent to be sure, but for now, we will not be publishing your paper. Thanks for your patience. Cheers, Andrew. So Glenn accepts this and begins the long wait for Tompkins' investigation into the potentially bugged version of Blast to come out. Six months later. Happy six month anniversary, says Glenn. Should I still be expecting a response? In fact, it was a little over six months ago that I wrote, what he needs to do is rerun his original experiment. If need be, only for a single chromosome. 22 is the smallest and it is fine for the demonstration. But in his output, he needs to be able to identify the query and the subject sequences using the out format per parameters that I've talked about previously. Once he has done that, it is a simple manner of finding the query sequences that did not find a match and showing that they do in fact have a match, but that there is a bug in the software. That would have taken him a day at most. I have to remind you that you rejected my paper on the 6th of November last year, and in 18 days I reran the entire experiment across all chromosomes, not just a single chromosome as I'm asking Jeff to do. Rewrote large portions of the paper and resubmitted. The fact that he has had a lot more than six months to do this simple experiment, I've been asking since last October, I'm fairly certain that he has done it already and has gotten a result above 95% similarity, but he is just hoping that I will go away. Cheers. Snelling responds a few days later, apologetic for the delay due to fieldwork, saying, Hi Glenn, I have checked with Jeff on his progress on what is a far more comprehensive study than just the experiments you have suggested are all that are necessary. He assures me that his work is almost complete and that he only has to wait for the results of the last few runs before he is ready to report the outcomes. He has outlined to me what has been involved and I am satisfied that explains why it has all taken so long. Thoroughness in covering all bases requires time, so be patient a little longer and you will have your technical reply from Jeff. He is not simply hoping any problem will go away, but he is doing his homework thoroughly. Andrew. Several months later. Hi Andrew, it has now been more than eight months since Jeff last responded and coming up to a year since I submitted my paper. Your last message said that Jeff, quote, only has to wait for the results of the last few runs before he is ready to report the outcomes, unquote. And that was a little over eight weeks ago. So where are we at? Is he ready to report something? Anything? Smiley face. Hi Glenn, sure, time flies, but I know Jeff is working on his response by thoroughly testing different versions of the algorithm, plus testing with other algorithms, all of which takes time. He will definitely have a lot to report. I saw him a few weeks ago and he was very busy working away at it, so please continue to be patient. Cheers, Andrew. I don't understand the point of testing all those other versions and even other algorithms. The only question he needs to answer are, quote, is there a bug in the version I used and is that the reason I got 70%, unquote. He can answer both of these with yes and he could have done that in a couple of days and should have done that eight months ago. I think you need to have a very candid conversation with Jeff and ask those very questions. One, is there a bug in the version you used? Clearly yes or do you disagree? And two, if you work around the bug, do you get a result of 90 96 to 97 percent. Clearly yes or do you disagree? That's all you need to decide whether to accept or reject my paper. Nothing else is relevant. From the sounds of it, Jeff is writing another paper entirely but that's got nothing to do with his response to my paper. I don't deserve to be kept in the dark for so long so I'd appreciate some insight, even a half-written report, as to what he is doing and why. As things stand right now, it certainly won't look very impartial to an external observer. And the longer this goes on, the worse it's going to look when it eventually comes out. I know both AIG and ICR express a belief that secular journals are unwilling to consider creationist research, so I guess here is a chance for you to show that creationists can be the bigger man. You'll be applauded if you publish, you'll lose a lot of credibility if you don't. 
Thanks. Glenn. We are satisfied that Jeff is doing the necessary detailed research to respond to your accusations and also at the same time settle the central question of your assertions. It matters not how you think Jeff should handle his response. He needed to test different versions of the algorithm and talk to the software developers. Jeff has told me today he has completed all the necessary research and is now working on the response paper, which he will have to me soon. So you will get to see his response in due course when it's published and not before. Cheers, Andrew. Eventually. Hi, Glenn. Attached is Jeff's response paper, which was posted today. You get acknowledged. Cheers, Andrew. Obviously, I'll respond in full when I have a chance to read it properly. First, few comments. One, did my paper pass peer review? If so, where was it published? Two, did Jeff's paper pass peer review? How did they review such a long and technical paper in such a short amount of time? Who reviewed it? You said on the 18th of August that he had finished his research and started on his response paper. So in seven weeks, he has written the response paper, perhaps four weeks work, and someone has peer reviewed it in three weeks? Wow, that's a quick turnaround. Three, Jeff is using ungap to derive his new 88% figure. That's an error. How did that one pass peer review? Four, completely bizarre that Jeff would list me as representing Tibra Capital when I don't ever recall mentioning it to him, and also given the fact I haven't worked there since 2009. That's all for now. Hi, Glenn. I was courteous enough to send you his paper. I am under no obligation to answer any or all of your questions. Jeff has been working on this project for many months, including the preparation of the paper, but exactly how long it took him to prepare the paper, I don't know because he works in Dallas at ICR. Yes, his paper was peer reviewed over several weeks, rather critically, I might add, including by an expert in the relevant software. Your paper did not pass peer review, so it was not published. You were acknowledged by Jeff, though. I guess he chose your last affiliation that he knew of. Any errors you claim he made are just your claim. Cheers, Andrew. Hi, Andrew. True, no one is going to come and put you in jail for not answering any of my questions, but according to your own guidelines for authors, when you reject a paper, it looks like you need to supply the stated reasons for rejection. We were in an absurd situation last year where the author being critiqued was also the reviewer of my paper, so it's not exactly an impartial situation. Jeff's responses last year showed someone that is clearly out of his depth when it comes to the Blast software, and it seems he hasn't taken anything on board because he is still using the ungapped parameter as if indels didn't exist. Exist. I have to give him some credit though, the level of obfuscation in his paper is extraordinary. Anyway, I'll be curious to see how this whole thing plays out. Cheers, Glenn Williamson. Glenn, since your paper was not accepted and logged into our submission and review system, I am under no obligation to supply you anything, but it was reviewed by several competent people. Andrew. I hope I don't need to point out that this is certified weenie behavior. Snelling is literally like, I'm not telling. <laughs> regard to any of Glenn's questions, despite the fact that Glenn was the one who brought the error to Tompkins' attention, as Tompkins mentions, in his paper. Who do you suppose peer-reviewed Glenn's paper, you guys? Who do you think it was? Who do you think was the best person to pick from the middling staff at the Answers Research Journal with actual PhDs? Who do you think they got to look at Glenn Williamson's paper? Do you think it was Tompkins? I think it was Tompkins. You'll notice too that whoever peer reviewed Tompkins' work was an expert in the software, not actual comparative genomics. That person would have absolutely no idea whether or not gapped or ungapped should be used as a parameter, but I guess it was good that he didn't use another bugged version of the program. I guess that's an improvement, even though that was a monumental error in the first place. I can't believe he didn't catch it. Now, everybody makes mistakes, but if you're doing work that is supposed to be so groundbreaking that it overturns a paradigm that's been held for decades and is held by every comparative genomics researcher on the planet, don't you think you'd maybe check for bugs? Maybe run the analysis a couple of times? Or maybe compare it with a control? But the fact that he used a bugged version of Blast was indeed very embarrassing, and Jeff couldn't have someone like Glenn Williamson, a secular scientist, blow him up like this. So he simply rejected Glenn Williamson's paper as the peer reviewer and then published on the error himself. Documented anomaly in recent versions of the BlastN algorithm and a complete reanalysis of chimpanzee and human genome-wide DNA similarity using Nukmer and Lasts. Oh, a documented anomaly, huh? By who, Jeff? Who documented the anomaly? Oh, a computer programmer of financial trading algorithms, eh?
I guess we're lucky he cited Glenn at all. In this analysis, we see Blast utilized alongside two other tools, Lasts and Nookmer. It ran a very similar analysis to the 2013 piece, but now the slices are standardized to 300 base pairs each. Coverage was good, with a maximum coverage of 3 million per chromosome, which is... It's ungapped again! Look, Pim, I know it's our job to help this guy and everything, but I think this guy's a lost cause. He's obviously made up his mind. Why don't we just cut our losses and get out of here? Okay, before we play around with some numbers and really sink our teeth into the consequences of Jeffrey Tompkins' methodology, let's finally talk about the other part of the problem. Because the ungapped parameter isn't all there is. In fact, it's only half the story. To do this, we're going to have to come back to that 2011 paper, the one that kind of kicked everything off, genome-wide DNA and alignment similarity or identity for 40,000 chimpanzee DNA sequences queried against the human genome. And we're going to make our way back down to the table. So we know he used ungapped in this analysis, but the table is going to lead us to the big problem. So like I said, it's poorly formatted, uh, but what you need to know is that this column right here, which is the percent identity in aligned bases, it's 80%, right? 80% all the way down or in the 80% range, I suppose I should say. And remember, if you're using an ungapped alignment, you should be looking at protein coding regions, right? You're not including the indel. So really and truly, we should be seeing 98% plus. Why is it so low? Let me tell you. So that 87% is actually gleaned by taking a percent of the average number base matches per query sequence and the average number aligned bases per query sequence. So 109 is 87.2% of 125. When you go to the GitHub of the 2015 paper, the blast redo section here, you get an opportunity to see the BLAST redo summary, wherein he lists all of the chromosomes, the uh, identity alignments, so the percent identity like that BLAST gave, the alignment length, the Q sequence length, the number of Q sequences, the number of hits, the hit frequency, the query identity, and the overall identity. And I confirmed this with Glenn, who it turns out had to reach out and ask Tompkins himself, at least with regard to the 2013 paper, because Tompkins is super vague as to how he actually gets his percent identities in that one. And it seems like this is what's going on. In his paper, Glenn says, before discussing the results of individual experiments, a discussion on how Tompkins arrives at his final result is in order. From personal communications with Dr. Tompkins, I have been able to ascertain how he calculates his figures of 70% and have reproduced the relevant portion below. And a little bit later, he says it point blank. Dr. Tompkins' calculation method to arrive at a final figure is also inappropriate given his use of the ungapped parameter. He calculates the average percent query identity by taking into account count the length of the alignment, the average alignment length, as a percentage of the length of the query, the average query sequence length. So to get a percent identity for each given chromosome, Tompkins is just averaging all of the lengths and then taking a percent of that average length as compared to the 300 base pair query. Except remember, he's using ungapped. So what do you think that does to the length of his matches? Let's do a little experiment. So here are some mysterious BLAST results, and I'm not going to tell you yet what I've compared here. You can use your imagination. You'll probably figure it out if you think about it for more than two seconds. There are some columns that I want you to pay attention to here, and we'll reveal what this comparison was later. But that's going to be your percent identity column, your length column, and your Q length column. Really, mostly it's just going to be the percent identity and the length. Now what I did is I took 1,300 base pair long segments from organism A and I compared them to organism B. So first things first, let's see what our average percent identity was for this chromosome of these organisms. So if you type average here and we take it of our percent identity column, what you'll find is that it's about 98%, 97.86% reasonable sounds about right for what we're comparing you don't know what that is yet but uh but we'll get there you can see that the average length is about 300 which is to be expected given that was our slice size and we're doing a gapped comparison here right green for gapped 
Now, if you did what Tompkins did and you took an average length here, the average length would be like 299, almost 300. If you took a percentage of that, then the average percent similarity would be almost 100%. So now we're looking at an ungapped comparison of the same two organisms, blue for sad. So let's check out the average percent identity for this bad boy. Average percent identity, in your spoilers, it's going to be really similar to our gapped comparison. Except like Carter said, ha, ah, it's a little bit higher. Wow, cool, good to know. But now let's check out our average length. If we do average here, Take that of our length column. Oh, uh-oh, it's 270. That's 90%. Now, why might that be? Well, again, it's because that ungapped parameter is resulting in a lot of teeny tiny itty bitty little sequences, little matches. And as you can see, here's the problem, right? Most of them are shorter matches. They're not spanning the entire or even most of that 300 base pair slice. This is problematic because, uh-oh, they're not normally distributed, are they? Look at that ski slope shape. So the problem isn't just ungapped, it's the combination of the ungapped parameter with Tompkins' weighting methodology. And that's going to come up again later, but in a different way. But okay, hold on. I know what you're thinking, right? Like, I can sit here and show you the math and say this is inappropriate, look what this does, in sort of a vacuum. But like, what if we indulged Tompkins' methodology? What if we just pretended like his methods were fine. I mean, let's say for a moment Tompkins is right. Let's say that humans and chimpanzees are only 89% similar genomically, or they are only 84% or 80% or 70%. Let's say that that is the number. What does it mean? Because without reference to other species, to other species comparison, this number means absolutely nothing. What if Tompkins were to use his methods and compare rats and mice, for example? Now, Tompkins is a young Earth creationist. He's collaborated with ICR and Answers in Genesis and CMI, all of these big young Earth creationist organizations. And for those of you who don't know, young Earth creationists and creationists in general, but typically the young Earthers, tend to believe that in the beginning, when God created all of the animals on the planet, he created them according to their kind and that they are allowed to diversify diversify and change a little bit, just not too much. So for example, there's a cat kind and all cats are related to one another and can change within that group. And all dogs are related to one another and can change within that group. But they would of course not accept that humans and chimpanzees are a part of the same kind or a part of the same group. So what about something like rats and mice? What if Tompkins' methods showed that rats and mice are less similar, genomically speaking, than humans and chimps? Because Answers in Genesis lists rats and mice as a part of the same kind on their giant Noah's Ark boat replica in the middle of Kentucky, and I would suspect that Tompkins would agree that rats and mice are a part of the same created kind, so what would happen? If rats and mice are less similar than humans and chimps, his argument that his reduced number for human-chimp similarity negates common ancestry between the two organisms falls apart, doesn't it? And seriously, isn't it so strange that he doesn't ever compare anything else? I mean, he's been obsessed with this particular number for decades, but he's only ever compared one human and one chimp. He's not even comparing chimps to chimps or humans to humans, just human versus chimp. And that's it. Nothing else for reference. And you know, isn't that strange? Isn't that suspicious? So I thought, uh, why not compare more species? Why not just compare as many as we can and see how Tompkins' methods hash out with those things that creationists would consider to be related organisms. Now, obviously, I've told you already that running an ungapped comparison and waiting the way Tompkins is waiting here is entirely inappropriate and kind of a waste of time. But like, what if we just took him at his word? What if we just utilized his methodology and did what he evidently wasn't brave enough to do, 
What if we expanded the analysis? So one more time for the uninitiated, there is a reason as to why this is relevant for creationists. They, and specifically young earthers, believe the earth was created by God some 6,000 years ago and that Noah's flood was a legitimate worldwide event that is responsible for the entirety of the geologic column. Answers in Genesis and the Institute for Creation Research, thus Tompkins, believe that all modern animals descend from the archetypal species that Noah took with him on that big boat. Creationists call these groups kinds, and it roughly translates to the family level in modern taxonomic terms. So Felidae, the cat kind, has a progenitor cat pair on the ark that then diversified into all felids we have today, as well as all fossil felids in between now and the start of the Cenozoic in just 4,400 years. If that sounds like evolution, but just on fast forward, that's because it is, and they just don't like to call it that. Functionally, there is no difference. Of course, this creates a problem, right? Modern lions and modern house cats are about 95% similar, and young earth creationists consider them to be the same kind. Yet this is below 98.8%, isn't it? Despite using the exact same methods that give us the human-chimp similarity. This is why Tompkins needs the number to be lower, and I, as well as others, suspect it's also why we don't get any other comparisons. So I did the comparisons, with a ton of help from Glenn Williamson himself, as well as from my husband, who is also a computer programmer, and we devised an excellent system to do these comparisons, and we ran quite a few of them. So this is the config file. It contains the various methods that BLAST has available to it right now as designed by me and influenced by like Glenn and my husband and things like that. So there are only four options here. I've really trimmed the fat, but what I hope you can appreciate is we have a good gapped method, a good ungapped method. This is just so you can compare the difference between gapped and ungapped. It's mostly default parameters. Then we have Tomkins 2013 and Tomkins 2013 with max HSPS. It depends on which version of Blast you're using. If you want to replicate my work for yourself, make sure that if you're using Tomkins 2013, you're using the version of Blast that he used in that paper. If you use the second one, Tomkins 2013 with max HSPS. This is going to be the one that we're using in the following examples. Sometimes I've called it like Tompkins True or Tompkins Fixed or Tompkins Real, whatever. This is the actual way that he was doing it with the max HSPS function available to him because it was like Blast had it as a default. And then Tompkins 2018, if you feel like using this, you can. If you just want to explore his methods, be my guest. But these are like copied and pasted from his paper, so feel free to double check me on this. Again, the ones we're going to be paying close attention to for the following comparisons are going to be Good Gapped and Tomkins 2013 with Max HSPS. We'll get into this more later, but that Max HSPS thing is really, really important. It basically tells Blast how many matches to report, because obviously if you have a, a sequence, there's going to be many alignments that you can start all over the genome. And if you have Blast report all of them to you, you are going to get a gazillion partial matches that are erroneous. They have nothing to do with the true match. They're going to be like 50% similar, 60% similar. To include matches that aren't the top hit in your alignment and in your percent identity would be to be the world's worst geneticist. So what we did is we had our query organism and our database organism for each of our two comparisons. So let's say we were comparing a dog to a wolf. The dog is our query organism and the wolf is our database organism. One chromosome was compared at a time instead of doing obviously like a full genome comparison. The end result was a full genome comparison, but we did chromosome 1, then chromosome 2, then chromosome 3, etc, etc. So in the case of our dog and our wolf for chromosome 1, from the dog we selected randomly 300 base pairs 1,000 times. So we got a full coverage on chromosome 1 and on every subsequent chromosome of 300 thousand base pairs. Genomes are really big, but the sampling is random, and Tompkins actually showed in the paper we just went over, this 2015 paper, that there's really only about a 1% difference in, you know, 1,000 versus 10,000 versus 100,000, so I stuck with what was manageable for my actual computer, which was a total of 300,000 base pairs per chromosome. BLAST then spits out a CSV for our results and then also places the percent similarity into one big CSV file so we can compare all of our organisms with a given range. I'd like to take a minute to note here that the way we're running these comparative genomics is not ideal. This is not how you should run them, obviously, because we're using Tomkins' methods. Taking 1,300 base pair sequences is just not how this is done. 
I also would have liked to cover more of each chromosome than just 300,000 base pairs, but again, like, this is a really heavy-duty run for a computer to make. So what I will say is that if Tompkins thinks that my coverage, that my number of base pairs is not enough, he's got a great computer. He should just run my exact same analyses, but using his big fancy nice computer. And let's see the results that he gets. Alternatively, if I have to, I will pay for some kind of cloud service to make my point. There are no links that I will not go to to ensure that Tompkins is sufficiently busted on this topic. For the human to chimp comparison, I use the most up-to-date human gene genome, the completed telomere to telomere assembly, and the most recent chimpanzee genome published in 2023. Excluding the sex chromosomes, which were not available for every species comparison, the good method yielded an average similarity between humans and chimpanzees of 97.8%. This is right around what conventional numbers yield. The range was 96.2% to 98.3%, which is also within the conventional range. My Tompkins methodology with my Tompkins weighting yielded an average percent similarity of 88.8% with a range of 86.2 to 90.5%. This is higher than what Tompkins reported, and I suspect that's because I'm using more up-to-date genomes, but still significantly lower than conventional numbers. And the two species from earlier, those Excel spreadsheet comparisons, that was a human and a chimp, but just an earlier version of chromosome 22 for both species. Now what about dogs and dingoes? The average percent similarity for the good method was 99.5%, with a range of 99.4 to 99.6%. This is not surprising. Very few people are going to contest the relatedness of dogs and dingoes. But by the Tompkins methodology, the average percent similarity was 94.6%, with a range of 93.4 to 96.5. Now, that's still higher than the human and chimp percent similarity by Tompkins' methodology, but something seems to be going on here. Dogs and maned wolves, by the good method, hash out to be about 98.3% similar on average, with a range of 98 to 98.5%. Again, not surprising, they're both members of Canada. Tompkins' method yields a mean percent similarity of 85.5% with a range of 83.3 to 87%. You'll notice that this is lower than the numbers I got for humans and chimps by Tompkins' methodology, and smack dab in the range for humans and chimps in his own paper. Yikes! Things get worse, though, because creationists like Tompkins also think that dogs and foxes are in the same kind. The good method yielded a conventional average of 96.6%, with a range of 96 to 96.9%. And Tompkins' method yields a mean percent similarity of 75.8% with a range of 75.4 to 77.5%. Because foxes and maned wolves are both more dissimilar to dogs than humans are to chimps, by Tompkins' methodology, we're looking at at least a human kind, a chip kind, a maned wolf kind, a fox kind, and a dog kind that also includes dingo. But you can do this with all sorts of animals. For example, Lions and lynxes are both supposed to be a part of the cat kind, Felidae. By conventional means, they are on average 97% similar, with a range of 96.7 to 97.3%, and conventionally, this is still less than humans and chimps. Tomkin's mean percent similarity is 79.9%, with a range of 77.7% to 81.3%, quite a bit lower. All of baboons and rhesus macaques are both meant to be a part of the same kind of Cercopithecidae. They are 97.9% similar by conventional means, with a range of 96.9 to 98.1%. And we see the same problem with Tompkins' methods again, with an average percent similarity of 86.8% and a range of 81.3 to 88.8%. Standard cows, or Bos taurus, and water buffalo are 96.3% similar by conventional methods with a range of 96 to 96.6 percent, again lower than the human chimp similarity at 98 percent, and by Tompkins' methodology, the mean is 80.5 percent with a range of 78.5 to 81.8 percent, also lower than the human chimp similarity. 
And lastly, we have our most distantly related pair, rats versus mice, with a mean similarity by conventional means of 84.4% and a range of 79.8% to 87%, while by Tomkins methodology, we get an average percent similarity of 41.4% with a range of 40.2 to 43%. Both of these guys are supposed to be of the true rodent kind. It's not a coincidence that the divergent states via evolutionary theory match these genetic similarities. Under the lens of biblical kinds, of course, this makes no sense. So the really critical take-home point here is that it doesn't matter how you compare organisms. You can use any method you want with any level of weighting, with any type of gapping, mask the genome, however you feel. If you're being standardized across organisms, humans are always going to be the most similar to chimpanzees and vice versa. I guess I should say panins and humans will always be most similar to one another. And these two groups are more similar genomically than lions and cats, than water buffalo and cow, or than baboons and macaques. But some of you out there paid very close attention during that 2015 paper, and some of you out there are saying, well, so what, Guts at Gibbon? You're just debunking his BLAST results. Don't you remember? He corroborated those BLAST results using Last Z and using Nookmer. Oh man, shoot, and it's right in the title there, isn't it? Complete reanalysis of chimpanzee and human genome-wide DNA similarity using Nookmer and Last. Well, crud. I guess we need to look at those too. Before I got too deep into it though, I wanted to reach out to my old pal Glenn Williamson to see if by chance he'd done any of this already. He already did the Nookmer comparison. Yeah, he, he looked at the Nookmer stuff already. And it got posted in the Junk Science subreddit by a friend of Ruhif's and an old pal of mine, r slash ace of spades. So let's take a look at the Nookmer analysis and, uh, and see what we can't suss out, shall we? The post here says Ruhif downloaded a copy of this script, the one that Tomkins actually published, and ran it for himself against human chromosome 20. When he used the same parameters as Tomkins, it took a few days to run, and he got results that looked as follows. S1 and E1 are the start and end points for the first file, human, and S2 and E2 are the start and end points for the matching sequences in chimpanzees. So here's start and end for human, and start and end for chimpanzees. Now, remember, when Tompkins did his Nookmer comparison, he got about 88% as a similarity for most of the human to chim comparisons. But specifically down here, since Glenn was looking at chromosome 20, we can see that for chromosome 20, Tompkins gets a mean of 87.9% or about 88%. Heading back over to Glenn's results as posted by Ace of Spades, we can see that the human sequence from chromosome 20 is being aligned all over the chimpanzee chromosome, and the best hit is 97.44%. But it's not the only hit. In fact, this script tried to align the same general section of human chromosome 20 all over chimp chromosome 20 and reported several partial matches, 83.5%, 83.4%, 86.4%. So geneticists would look at this and they would say, oh, okay, well, we have one really good match and a lot of partial matches for the same sequence all across the chimpanzee genome. The one we should keep is the best match. That's the most likely to be the true match at 97.44%. Um, but do you know what Tomkins did? Let me just show you what he did. Let's average all of these sequences together. Ace of Spades talks about this a little bit more. He says, the CSV file contains all of the matches that were returned for the sequences which lay within the original syntenic match. If we average out the percent identity weighted by the length of each match, we see that they drag the average down to 89.29%, which is pretty close to Tompkins' overall result of 88%. He seems to have just ignored the fact that he was matching the one human sequence onto many different chimpanzee sequences, which were clearly not the same. This is is remarkable. How could he possibly have failed to notice this? Did he even glance over his results or did he notice this and choose to go with it anyway because the overall results he were getting were too convenient? This is pretty analogous to not using max HSPS in BLAST. Okay, so what about last Z? What did he do in last Z? Well, I reached out to Glenn and he hadn't fooled around with it yet. So I started tinkering with it myself with the help of my husband. And, and I also reached out to Dr. Harris, the guy who developed last Z at Penn State. Now remember, the thing about Max HSPS is it's responsible for returning only the best hit instead of every potential partial hit all across the genome or at least across the database. So what would this mean if you were to compare something, I don't know, 
to itself. So here's my results for that, my last Z results, and this took forever. So I would love to go through and do a ton of last Z analyses, but it's honestly just very time consuming, especially for the point that I'm trying to make, which I think this does a decent enough doing on its own. So you'll see that we did like 10,000 base pairs each. So we started from uh, 10,000 to 20,000, 20,000 to 30,000, 30,000 to 40,000, et cetera, et cetera, um, all the way up to 11,000. And what you'll see is that, again, we're comparing a chunk of human chromosome 22 to itself. So you should expect that there should be 100% matches. And of course we see that 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%. But what if you did what Tompkins did? What if you took the average percent identity for like the whole alignment process? Well, let's do it. Equals average and then we'll take our percent column here uh 72 percent well 73 percent so i guess what i'm saying here is jeffrey Tompkins, you're done you are finished here none of these methods are appropriate and what's insane to me is they are all inappropriate in different ways i don't think you could do this by accident i don't think you could stumble across these three disparate separately erroneous methodologies accidentally converging on one another and that makes me really suspicious i think jeff at some point must have figured out that ungapped and that weird weighting system he was using didn't work and I imagine it also got ridiculously tiresome trying to find ways to force methodologies to corroborate each other. Because these are all the papers up to 2015, 2011, 2013, and 2015, all the same methods. But Tonkins doesn't quit publishing on the subject at 2015. He continues with different methods. Good, you might be thinking. Great. Jeffrey Tompkins has switched to a more reasonable methodology, and now all is right in the world. You know where you are, right? After 2015, he publishes in 2016 an article titled Analysis of 101 Chimpanzee Trace Read Datasets, Assessment of Their Overall Similarity to Human and Possible Contamination with Human DNA. So here we are with our little 2016 paper. Jeffrey Tompkins is going to be using trace reads this time. These are like longer sequences, not our little 300 base pair segments. However, they do average 704 base pairs uh, and he's comparing them to the human genome and let's take a little peep at our methodology as we scoot on down. So we have our abstract. He actually doesn't waste a ton of time in his introduction this time. We get right into the materials and methods. So moving down to our BLAST parameters, we can see that they are here. So the following parameters, eValue 1, word size 11, there's his out format, and then he says max target sequence 1, max HSPS 1, dust, no soft masking false, percent identity 50. That's a little weird. Uh, gap open three, gap extend three, number of threads 10. It's, it's gapped. Oh my God. The analysis is gapped. Holy crap. We did it, boys. We finally did it. We ran something with a decent, not perfect, but decent methodology, at least compared to the nonsense we were using before. Learning from our mistakes. Oh my God. This is a monumental win for young earth creationists everywhere. We have seen here concrete evidence that young earth creationists can actually change when faced with a mistake. Although, admittedly, it's not like Tompkins admitted that there was a mistake previously. He just kind of subtly changed around the methods and hoped that no one would notice. But I noticed Jeff. So with these better methods, what does he actually get? Well, now this is strange. It may be that greater precautions towards human DNA contamination were taken in the later processing producing, or in the later in the project, producing less contamination. If the data from these seemingly less contaminated sets are considered, the chimpanzee genome is no more than 85% similar to human. If all the data sets are taken together despite apparent human DNA contamination, then the chimpanzee genome is no more than about 90% similar to a human. So he's getting like, he's kind of pushing for that 85% number as I'm sure you can tell. And if you go and read this entire thing, the, the whole point of the paper is that he's like, the, the current chimpanzee assembly 
is contaminated with human DNA. And as I mentioned earlier, like conventional science has taken notice of potential issues with the assemblies of other mammal genomes outside of the human. And since then, because remember this is in 2016, we got an assembly, specifically the chimpanzee genome, that was used without reference to the human, that Tompkins later has a paper on, we'll touch on that next, that isn't contaminated with human DNA. Now, I'm not saying the earlier ones were necessarily. I'm saying Tomkins says it's not contaminated with human DNA. So we have his seal of approval, which is really all that matters when you think about it. Now, he's still getting this 85% number, right? Still in the 80s, even though he's like, okay, maybe it's 90%, but we're going to go with 80, 85, excuse me. So um, what's up with that? Perhaps we should introduce some controls, some references and run this comparison with another pair of species, just like we did last time, because it went so well then. Whilst I was gearing up to make this comparison, I found that someone else already had. Joshua Swamidas. Joshua Swamidas is a religious scientist who accepts evolution and the age of the earth, and published a write-up on his forum, Peaceful Science, titled Mind the Controls, about this very topic. And he's been on this channel before. He's a friend of the channel. He notes that using Tomkins' methods in his 2016 piece does in fact yield an 85% similarity between humans and chimps, and that he got the same results when using this, at the time, newly published raw data. Swamidas thought to test the veracity of these results by introducing controls. You'll notice earlier that in the myriad of different comparisons that I ran myself, I didn't include rats and mice, and that's because I was saving it for this portion of the video since Dr. Swamidas has already done the work. Swaminas downloaded the same contiguous sequences that Tonkins utilized and compared the chimpanzee to the chimpanzee and got an 87% similarity. Then he compared humans and humans and got an 89% similarity. Then humans and chimps, as opposed to the other way around, and got 87% similarity. Swaminas then decided to compare rats and mice. Mice and rats are typically thought to be around 82% similar by conventional means compared to the 98.8% percent in humans and chimps. So Swamina simply ran the comparison using Tomkins's methods and found that it yields a 70% similarity between rats and mice. At least in this case, since Tomkins was utilizing the gapped parameter, the differences do scale. They're not exactly pure nonsense like with the ungapped parameter. For instance, chimpanzees compared with chimpanzees are more similar than humans versus chimps, which are more similar than rats versus mice, even though the actual number itself is considered considerably off when compared with conventional means. Now Tompkins is welcome to claim that his results are the accurate results as compared to the dozens and dozens and dozens of conventional studies over the decades, but this would be a tacit admission that his methods show humans and chimps are both separate kinds as well as rats and mice, for a total of four kinds between the four organisms. Swaminas suggested that the errors are actually methodological in nature, but that the controls would have at least brought to Tompkins' attention that something was amiss with in his methodology. But remember, Tompkins doesn't want to utilize the controls. He wants to introduce the human chimp value in isolation, in a form that feels most controversial and compelling to young earth creationists. So what I want you to take a moment and notice here is just how weaselly all of this seems. Now it's possible, it is truly possible that Tompkins is genuinely discovering all these different methodologies organically, exploring them as a good scientist would. But I don't buy that for a second. I think that he's specifically trying to minimize the human-chimp genomic similarity and that he is willing to try absolutely any method to get the job done. Unfortunately, people keep testing his methods, exploring them, peer-reviewing them, if you will, and finding out that they suck, which forces him to pivot. It all must be very stressful for him. Now, one thing I will point out as a quick aside is the role that Richard Bugs plays in all of this. Bugs is a geneticist, and a conventional one by all accounts. He caused a bit of a stir in the 2010s in some circles because he actually felt that 84% similarity between humans and chimps was appropriate. He got this number by Max maximizing differences as well, counting each base difference as a difference in and of itself, and counting the unsequenced regions at the time in the dissimilar category. Of course, Bugs was okay with counting differences like this across the animal kingdom. 
all gaps would widen and humans and chimps would still be one another's closest living relatives. This didn't stop countless creationists from name dropping him, nor did it stop Tompkins from specifically claiming that their work corroborated one another's. Now, we could go into the details as to why some people did find Richard Bugs' method of counting up differences to be appropriate, but it's basically akin to debating whether or not you should count a page duplication in a book as a duplication of a page, or every letter as a singular difference when accounting the total similarity between the two books. It ultimately doesn't even matter though because in 2020 Richard Bugs published a new method of comparing genomes and found humans and chimps to be about 96% similar. I've since reached out to Richard Bugs to see how he currently feels on the matter and what he told me is that he thinks the 84% number still holds pretty well but he also told me that he thinks the gaps between everything widen if you're taking an honest appraisal of every single difference on the whole. So for instance, humans under Richard Bugg's lens will not be 99 or even 98 or even 97% similar. The number is going to drop below 94% if only slightly. The point being that if you use Bugg's calculation methods, every gap widens. You're just changing the scale of things. He hammers this point home by saying that, yes, humans and chimps are going to be most similar to one another, basically, no matter how you slice it. But we still have one last paper to cover, and this is his most recent ARJ publication on the topic in 2018 titled, Comparison of 18,000 de novo assembled chimpanzee contigs to the human genome yields average blast and alignment identities of 84%. And this is his last chance for now at least because this is the most recent methodological piece on the subject. This is his shot to convince us, to convince me, that he has something going for him. Now given this was in 2018 and it's 2023 and scientists still hold that humans are 96 to 98.8 percent similar to chimpanzees, well that should give you a clue. This time we finally have what Jeff's been waiting for, a chimpanzee genome that has not used a human reference, as we've talked about several times before. One of the chief problems with all versions of the chimpanzee genome prior to Pantro 6, this is the genome that we utilize in our analyses, is that they were not constructed through the use of an accurate integrated physical genetic map and its corresponding genomic resources in a systematic fashion like the human genome and other key model animal genomes. Instead, short DNA sequences generated by the sequencing machinery, known as trace reads, largely produced a whole genome through a shock round approach that were assembled onto the human genome using it as a reference scale. Baffled. But not anymore, this time we're using Pantro 6. And as he says here, another bonus, this one doesn't seem to be having the same issue as the previous versions with human contamination. We've got a, a fix for that, a fix for the human scaffold, and um, this is going to be the real version. This time, for real. We see an acknowledgement of Richard Bugs, who we already covered down here, and he talks about the recent improvements with Pantro 5 and Pantro 6, and that he's going to perform the sort of objective reassessment of the human chip, a genomic similarity himself. Now, I, I can respect that. I can respect taking matters into one's own hands and doing an overly gratuitous analysis to make a point. Methods, one last time. Let's take a look at our parameters. E value 0.1, word size 11. There's our out format. Max target sequence 1, max HSPS 1, dust no, soft masking false, percent identity 50. Again, that's kind of sketch, but it doesn't really matter. Gap open 3, gap extend 3, number of threads 10. It's gapped again. Yay, yay, yay. That's fantastic. We, we're glad to see that. All is not well in the kingdom, though, and we'll get to that in a moment, because uh, Tompkins actually publishes his results on GitHub in a CSV file. We will come back to that. First, let's look at what he sort of proposes his results are here in the paper. So he talks about the sort of lengths of many of the sequences, how lots of the contiguous sequences were really short. This is the portion that we really care about here. Comparison to human. The main finding of the significance to the issue of alleged common ancestry between humans and chimpanzees is the fact that the average alignment identity was only 84% 
See Table 1. Despite the gap extension parameters being quite liberal, the average mean alignment length was only 10,509 bases as a result of the algorithm hitting a gap that was too large for it to traverse. Thus, only about one-third of each chimpanzee contig on average could be aligned to the human genome as the best hit. These data obviously exclude the less alignable portions of the contigs as well as those regions that would be completely unalignable. Thus, the overall identity of the chimpanzee genome compared to the human would actually be significantly lower than 84%. So that's where that 84% number comes from. And as you know, we went through his methods and it was fine, right? We're using gapped as a parameter. There are a couple of things that are kind of weird, but by and large, it's not a huge issue. And it doesn't have the same problem that the previous study that we looked at that Joshua Swaminoff checked with his controls, which is that they're kind of new RAR reads. These have had a little bit more time to, to be peer reviewed and to be refined. So what then is the problem? Well, before we dig into that, Let's kind of go down here towards his conclusion, because I quite like what he says down here. I think it's kind of funny. So he says, a glaring overall 20% DNA similarity difference between the human and chimpanzee genome is an evolutionary discrepancy that cannot be dismissed. And the reason it's now become 80% instead of 84 is because he cites Richard Bugs up here, who talks about 4.06 having no alignment to the chimp assembly. So he's just adding that in and reducing it down further. But we already talked about Richard Bucks. So this extreme level of genetic discontinuity raises serious issues for the evolutionary myth that humans and chimpanzees share a common ancestor not more than about three to six million years ago, which largely depends on the 98 to 99% DNA similarity to seem theoretically possible. This sentence is an absolute mess. First of all, the aggression. This is something that I didn't see in the previous papers and maybe I just didn't catch it. But here, this is like, this is gung ho. He is mad here. And he thinks he's really, you know, driven a stake in, or, or does he? Because again, we'll, we'll talk about how much does Tompkins know about his own work? How much does he know with regard to its robusticity? But he, who has ever said this? Who has ever said that the common ancestry between humans and chimps depends on 98 to 99% DNA similarity? No one has ever said that, ever. The point is that humans and chimpanzees are one another's closest living relatives, right? It's, it's the fact that it's reciprocal. Chimps are our closest living relatives and the reverse is also true. The fact that the similarity is very high is helpful in making the case, but it doesn't have to be 98%. It doesn't have to be 96%. It doesn't even have to be 90%. The point still stands. And again, in reference to other organisms, humans and chimps are closer than many, many pairs that young earth creationists like Jeffrey Tompkins would consider a part of the same created group, like cats and lions, or like Asian and African elephants, or like rats and mice. But I digress. Again, this is why he doesn't ever compare anything else other than humans and chimps. The uniqueness of mankind, as stated in Genesis, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them, Genesis 1 27, New King James Version, is now soundly confirmed by the scientific data. I think he dislocated his shoulders, his highly mobile ape-like shoulders with a reach like this. Like if we assume for a moment that his numbers are correct and humans and chimps are only 80% similar to one another, this would be like a Muslim individual pointing out that one sentence is different in the current version of the King James Bible and a version from like, I don't know, 100 years ago. And that makes Islam true and Christianity false. And that's if his numbers were right, which they're not. He's got to grapple with the overwhelming preponderance of everything else, but also his numbers are not correct. And uh, I'm going to prove that to you now by looking at his data. So let's do so together. If you scroll back up to that sort of materials and methods section here, you can click on the GitHub link and it's going to jump scare you with this picture of Jeffrey Tompkins that he uploaded to his GitHub account. You're going to click on chimp contigs here and it's going to take you to this little upload repository. And you're going to want to click on all 18k chimp contigs on homo.csv. Now you're going to need to download this CSV. So you're going to click on it. It's going to take you to, you know, the raw data, and then you're going to save that link so that you can then open it uh, within Excel, which is what we're going to do. So here's my Excel file. It's going to look different from yours because what you're going to want to do is take all of Tompkins' data, 
put it into a table and give some headers that are going to match the data, his actual output. And you can find his output uh, again back in his paper. So you have the sequence ID, that's the accession number, Q start, QN, the mismatch, the gap open, the P ident, percent identity, N ident, length, and Q lens. So I've labeled those for you here, just so we know what we're all talking about. So we're all on the same page. And what I've done is I've sorted by query length. So we've got our smallest query lengths at the top and the biggest ones at the bottom, which, which you can see, or which you can see rather, if we scroll down to the bottom of our roughly 18,000 uh, sequences. So here we go, we end with 17,991, um, and that's our largest query length or QLEN. So let's find out how Tomkins got that 84%. But first, allow me to tell you a little anecdote. I teach at a university, I teach biological anthropology lab, and what that means is that I have to deal with a lot of students. And what I've come to learn is that some students are better versed than others when it comes to understanding how math works. And what I mean by that is that sometimes students will come to me and they'll say, hey, I thought I had a much higher grade in my class than I actually have. And I'll say, well, how did you come up with this grade? And they'll walk me through it. And what they've done is they've taken all of the grades in their grade books, all their percentages for, dis for different grades, and they've averaged them to get a, a total percentage for their grade. Uh, but their mistake is they average tests that are like 100 points as being the same as just averaging the same with like five point attendance percentages. So five out of five, that's 100%. And they'll weight that the same as like a 60% out of 100 points for a test. And that of course erroneously leads them to, to come up with a grade that is higher than perhaps they thought because they aren't weighting the actual assessments. And this always disappoints me because I think to myself, you know, this is stuff I learned in middle school. I'm sure many of you learned how to weight things in middle school as well. And I always am concerned when I see 18 year olds and 19 year olds making this same mistake. So imagine my surprise when I come to find out that that is what Jeffrey Tompkins did. Looking at these numbers, again, our n ident, this is the number of identical base pairs in a length. So 203 identical base pairs out of a 208 length gives us a 97% similarity between the query and the database, between the chimpanzee and the human. Again, below it, we see 309 out of 444. That gives us a 69%. And if we scroll all the way to the bottom, we can see that we have out of our 18,000 or so contiguous sequences, we can see that we have um, 163,989 out of 167,095, which gives us a 98% similarity between those two sequences. So what Tompkins did is he just took the average of the percent identity column right here. Boom, there it is, 84.387%. He is weighing a 444 base pair sequence as identical to sequences that are over 150,000 base pairs long. He is making the mistake of a middle schooler. But here's the kicker with this. Um, let's do it the right way. So if we take the sum of our entire n ident, and then we take the sum of our entire length, and we divide the first by the second, we get 96%. When we weight them, we get conventional numbers. Tompkins, you goofball. I suspect this is also what happened back when he initially replicated Todd Wood's work in 2011 with default parameters. Now, before you say to yourself, wow, guts a given, awesome sleuthing, what you need to know is that I didn't have to figure this out. This was another one where someone else beat me to it. And this time it was our old pal, Glenn Williamson, who actually sussed this mistake out years ago. And I want to share something very, very funny with you. In this video titled Creationist Peer Review is Utter Utter Poo by Ruhit, Glenn Williamson, we see the exact same thing I just showed you because I used this as my lattice to pull it up and, and walk you through the situation. Now, this is great. Ruhif's awesome. I think Glenn has done a great job with all of this stuff. Um, but let's just scroll down to the comments section 
because the first comment as pinned by Ruhif is by Jeffrey Tompkins himself. What does he have to say? He says, Ruhif, aka Glenn Williamson, has put forth several deceptive arguments in this slanderous and crude video that do nothing to debunk my research when carefully considered. Oh, Jeffrey, my, that sounds quite convincing. I'm, I'm preparing myself for what is to come. First, Glenn uses the absurd argument of taking the average fuel efficiency of two automobile trips, one short and one long, with a sample size of n equals two, and then tries to compare this ridiculous example to my research where I calculated an average using a sample size of n equals 18,000. So I sort of took my own anecdotal version of what Ruhif did here, which is he used um, an example a fuel efficiency to show why you have to wait things. So he says, you know, you take this long trip from Sydney to Melbourne and then a short trip from his house to the supermarket. How do you actually come up with your average fuel efficiency? And it's, you have to actually wait it. You can't just take a, a rote average, right? Or a brute average, excuse me. So um, it doesn't matter what your sample size is, Jeff. You have to weight things no matter what. Like, like increasing the number doesn't change the requirements of having to weight things by their length. So he continues on and says, second, he calculates the average alignment identity by dividing the total number of nucleotide matches by the alignment length, giving 96%. No surprise here, because this is the standard average identity for regions that can be matched between the human and chimp using blast and gap extension, but does not include regions that are so dissimilar they cannot be matched by the algorithm, an important issue with Glenn conveniently never addresses. Fortunately, we addressed this in the video, and we talked about how you know, Richard Bugs has dealt with this and how he's come up with a new way of actually aligning genes and still comes up with 96%. We've also talked about how we've increased our actual um, coverage of the human genome and the chimpanzee genome, and the number has gone up of percentage similarity between the two organisms. Then he says, in fact, if we divide the total number of nucleotide matches by the total amount of sequences clear queried, we get about a 30% similarity, which is not an accurate estimate of similarity either. Yes, thank you, Jeff, for telling us another bad way you could run this. No one was suggesting that that's how it should be run. You're just saying, look, see, there's a worse way to do it. I didn't do it that way. He says, my method sought to get around these algorithm <laughs> limitation issues, and it just so happens that my approach of determining an average DNA similarity, which is entirely reasonable, just to assure us, it is reasonable, matches the exact same human chimp DNA identity of 84% achieved by University of London evolutionary geneticists, Richard Bugs used BLAST-Z genome myalignment results from the UCSC genome browser website. And then um, you get excited because there's like nine comments, but Jeff never comes back. So he's, he bails, he, he dodges, he dodges because Ruhif is like, Ruhif responds and says, let's discuss this one point at a time. LOL, off to a cracking start. I was actually getting a little bored with Flat Earther, so welcome to my channel. Let's discuss this one point at a time. So he, he talks about um, the fuel efficiency thing. He says, my fuel efficiency example is to demonstrate why you should give each sample a relative weight, then apply it uh, to however many samples you have, be it two or 18,000. A sample size of just two makes my point easy to understand. Of course, it still applies to n equals 18,000. Yeah, duh, it doesn't matter. So of course, uh, Jeffrey Tompkins does not reply to this point, but I did think it was very funny that <laughs> Jeff came storming the castle here to try and defend himself uh, and made himself actually look worse, at least in my opinion. So the other day I was browsing Reddit and there was actually a new Ask Reddit thread that I thought was kind of interesting. It was asking people their sort of anecdotal experiences with highly educated people, people with PhDs or otherwise higher education, who were really intelligent but had like kind of really weird, bad, wrong opinions in other areas. And to me, this felt like divine revelation from the Lord Almighty himself telling me that Tompkins has indeed blown it. But also, uh, you guys, like, it's really hard to get around the fact that he's got a PhD in genetics and doesn't know to wait sequences. That's alarming, isn't it? I think it's really telling that some creationist organizations have opted to move away from Tompkins and his work entirely. It seems like the old earth creationists and the intelligent design advocates really don't buy it, as we can see in this article at Evolution News, which is an intelligent design think tank website, 
called Human Chimp Similarity. What is it and what does it mean? And if we scroll down, we can see um, several different numbers will pop up. We see the myth of 1%. This has popped up before, but this is basically just the original figure that was like, it's not 99% for the full genome, it's 96 for the full genome, which is true. They go down continuing on to talk about Richard Bugs, talking about his original 2018 post, blog post, which I don't know if I told you this, but that's what Tomkins is citing when he's citing Richard Bugs, not a published paper, a blog post. When he actually did publish, um, again, it's it's 96%, as we saw with his previous um, publication on genomic comparisons in 2020. But they never really mentioned Tomkins. In fact, they don't mention Tomkins at all. We get a mention of his number, 84%, but... There's nothing really else. In fact, you go down to the uh, citations, if there are citations, oh, the citations are um, in text, you hover over them. There's no Tomkins. We can control F, Tom, Ken, no Tomkins. Jeff is out. And of course, the only other example I can really think of within the YEC community would be like Todd Wood. He had never bought the number in the first place. I don't believe Kurt Wise does either. So Tomkins is shoehorned. He's got AIG and he's got ICR and... That's about it. So we've taken the time here to go through many of Tomkins's larger methodological works with regard to the topic of the human and chimpanzee genomic similarity. We've seen that about half of them are bogus because they use the ungapped parameter, along with that super weird weighting system. And in those early papers, when he's not using BLAST with the ungapped parameter and weird weighting, he's using Nookmer and LASZ with the equivalent of no max HSPS, meaning in those latter two systems, you're not not going to get a 100% similarity of something to itself. And indeed, when I tried it, I didn't. So with the earlier BLAST versions, it completely violates the concept of created kinds with humans and chimps always being the most similar to one another and indeed being more similar than many pairs that young earth creationists would insist are in fact related. And if you're not using BLAST, then you've got way bigger problems with that lack of max HSPS. And we saw how when he switched up his methods, that didn't help things. Controls were needed in his 2016 paper, and when including them, it showed that work to be nonsense. And in his 2018 paper, he made a simple arithmetic mistake. He didn't weight his sequences. So there is not one piece of Jeffrey Tompkins' work with regard to this subject that stands up to any kind of scrutiny at all. And not even other creationists are buying it at this point. It's just the loyalists that stand by Tomkins' side. Since this video is a remake, I'd like to pop in here and say that that continues to be the case. Rob Carter, when he posed his criticisms to me, the very reason this video is getting remade and updated in the first place, when he finished his video, he concluded that yeah, Tomkins' methods don't work, and it doesn't matter which year you're looking at. So it seems that the creationists are well on their way to abandoning Jeffrey Tomkins, at least at present. So what do we do with this information, right? I mean, Tomkins has published in secular journals. He has a PhD, and his work in secular journals seems robust, at least as much as I can understand it. How does a guy like that, a first author on a dozen or so papers, manage to make such simple basic baby mistakes. Well, they don't. In fact, I am of the opinion, this is an opinion, that these are not mistakes at all and that Jeffrey Tompkins knows exactly what he's done here. It's not even so much the mistakes in isolation, it's the accumulation of the mistakes. It's how the methodology has warped and changed once confronted with peer review from secular scientists. And it kind of leads me to believe that Jeffrey Tompkins is doing a little coal hop dance, trying to stay afloat with these nonsense numbers for as long as possible. I am of the opinion that he is being deceptive. And unfortunately, this is an opinion that I find myself levying against more and more professional creationists the longer I do this job. To me, there's just no other explanation, especially having seen him directly respond to the weighted versus unweighted issue as posed by Glenn Williamson, a very basic error. And his response was basically, nuh-uh, it's not an error. I did that on purpose and it was the right thing to do. But it's just Brutally not. That leads me to my next question. How does an evangelical justify this? 
How would Tompkins justify this if this is indeed intentional and a sort of tactical series of mistakes? Well, I think that he must genuinely believe that he will be vindicated eventually. I think there's got to be some underlying hope that if he just holds the line now, eventually he'll be shown to be correct because he thinks that he's genuinely interpreting God's word, like the God of the universe's word. So, of course, he must be proven to be correct eventually. And I guess to him, it's just acceptable to lie in the meantime if it means saving more souls. This is all speculation. Again, like, Tompkins might be an absolutely lovely guy who's just really bad at mammal genetics and phenomenal at plant genetics. Swamidas has attested that he's a good guy, but I've never met him. I've only seen his work. I've only seen a lot of his work. And so, I have formed my own opinion, and you must form yours. So... This was where the video was supposed to end. It was completed and put up on Patreon for everybody to see, and then Jeffrey Tompkins decided to go on a sort of call-in interview-style show, and it allowed for a Q&A. So I made myself present, and myself and others got to ask Jeff some questions in the side chat, and that has given me cause to think. And this isn't because Jeff has changed my mind on anything with regard to the science, no, he's given me cause to reconsider my assessment of him as a person. As you just saw, my opinion on Jeffrey Tompkins has been, at least for the duration of studying for this video and preparing for this video and running experiments for this video, including reading all of Jeff's work related to this topic, has been that he is too educated to be making these kinds of mistakes. It can't be incompetence, so it must be deception. I realize that's a harsh dichotomy, but I really don't know what else it could be. If you have someone who is educated in a topic who's making mistakes, they're either making mistakes because it's a mistake, it's an accident, which is unlikely since he continues to make these same mistakes over and over and over again, even when they're pointed out to him, or the alternative is that they are intentionally doing what they're doing, meaning they are being deceptive. Those are really the only two options. It's incompetence or it's deception. And I don't really know what to do with Jeff. Let me explain why. So the people asking questions in the live chat for this show, which had about like 34 max people watching at any given time, consisted of me, Dan from Creation Myths, Joel Duff, a random guy named like Hermit Crab or something like that, and Standing for Truth. Like I said, Donnie is having a bad week. This is from Standing for Truth. Uh, he says, have we derived a percentage of genetic similarity between humans using the same methodology? used to get the 84% similarity between humans and chimpanzees? Would it be 99%? God bless. Donnie is actually asking this question in part due to me because I brought up the discrepancy to him the last time we spoke on someone else's channel. And what I said to him was that Tompkins' methods are improperly scaled. If humans and chimps aren't 98.8, .8, then the 99% between any two given humans would also widen. And this is because I was under the impression at the time that Tompkins' methods were at least internally consistent and were more similar to what Richard Bugs initially did, as we've seen in this video. That is not the case. Tompkins' methods just do not work up until 2015, and then after that he just doesn't wait anything. But I was tickled to see Donnie ask this question. Yeah, that's a really great question. And it actually, I had a guy, he's a friend of mine, he's actually involved uh, in the in the Human Genome Project, his specialty is retro elements and transposable elements. And he's, I can't give his name because he's, <laughs> he's trying to lay low. I guess the point here is, is that Jeffrey Tompkins has like a secret friend who worked on the Human Genome Project. And the implication, I guess, is that they were a creationist. We can just take him at face value at that. I don't really care. What he goes on to talk about, though, is structural variants. And Tompkins makes the point that his friend says that if you took the two most disparate human genomes with the most number of structural variant differences, that that difference can make the genomes ultimately like around 4% different. So like he's basically saying that the two most distant humans could probably be 96% similar. And then he's like, so how are we supposed to believe that we're only 1% different? different from a chimpanzee, like not understanding that structurally variant areas aren't all in the functional regions of the genome. So really we should be comparing like the human maximum structural differences to the 96 
number for human chimp comparison, including indels, because that's like part of what structural variants include, but also that some of those structural variants, in fact, a lot of them are going to overlap with areas that are already different between the human and chimp. So if humans can be 4% different from one another, and I don't think they can, I'm not a geneticist, but I did a literature search for this and couldn't find anything, then the maximum difference between two humans is still going to be more similar than any given human and a chimpanzee. But if you compare the structural variants between any two human genomes, they can be up to four and a half percent different from each other. So if any two humans based on structural variants can, you know, be up to 5% difference from each other, why, how are we only 1% different from a chimp? So, you know, we have a lot to learn, I think, about genome structure and variation and, and even in the human genome where they're still trying to uh, figure out all this structural variation that's present. So I think with this new DNA sequencing technology, the PAC bio sequencing technology, and there's there's ion torrent and other chemistries out there as well. They're proprietary that produce long reads. Uh, I think we're going to see a lot of really amazing, uh, interesting things coming out of, of the Human Genome Project. So the answer is no, we haven't run the same exact methods where we get an 84% for human and chimp on two humans to see if we get 99%. Or we hadn't until I did it. And using that method, using Jeffrey Tompkins' method, the difference is like 79 to 87%. Unless he's talking about using the weighted version of his 2018 numbers, which would give a 99-ish percent similarity for any two humans, and then a 96% similarity for human and chip. Another question from Creation Myths. Does a 1,000 base pair deletion present in one genome, but not the other, count as a single difference or 1,000 differences in your methodology? Uh... I'm not sure how I would answer that. I mean, it's it's <laughs> it's just a thousand base difference. So, yeah, I, I don't know. This is a really good question and really incredibly important as to understanding how someone would get a percent similarity between any two given organisms. The example that I used earlier was between two books. So what Dan is asking is if we have two books and in one book we have an entire page duplicated as compared to the other book. They're identical in every other way. Do we count the duplication of that page as a single duplication because one page was duplicated, it occurred in one event? Or do we take every single letter that's different between the two books as a difference in order to come up with a total percent difference? Uh, I'm not sure how I would answer that. You're not sure how to answer a question that is absolutely pivotal to coming up with the percent difference between two genomes. You're not sure? I mean, it's it's <laughs> it's just a thousand base difference. So yeah, I, I don't know that I would put any label on that necessarily other than it's just a difference. It's a thousand base difference, hypothetically, if that's what we're looking at. Yeah. What? He just, what, what is he saying here? He just said it's a difference. I, I would say it's a difference. I mean, you know, it's a thousand base pair difference. You know, hypothetical. Well, which one is it? Jeff? Okay. This is I from... mean, my, my, my methodology is, is looking at the overall picture, <laughs> not just trying to, you know, kind of narrow it down to some... Uh, yeah, anyways. Okay. I was stunned by this when I first saw it. I actually had my jaw on the floor. I can't believe it. He's just hand-waving away a massive stipulation as far as coming up with or declaring how you're coming up with your percent similarity. You absolutely have to be clear with how you are counting differences. Is an indel a difference or is every portion of an indel a difference? You have to be specific. This is just proper methodology, but it's not even that. It's not even that he's not being clear. It sounds like he doesn't really know the difference. It sounds like he doesn't think that it matters. And this is one of the most important things to be clear on when you're comparing two organisms within comparative genomics. And this is supposed to be the guy that is overturning the paradigm here. And he just doesn't seem to know. This is what caused me to make an amendment to this video. I don't know about Jeffrey Tompkins. Is he being deceptive? 
or is he kind of incompetent, at least when it comes to comparing mammal genomes? I don't know anymore. Um, this is from Gus Gibbon. Do you have any predictions on the similarity between other kinds you would accept as so? Cats, lions, dogs, wolves, rats, mice. Do you feel genetics is the way forward with kinds? <clears throat> I've actually looked at that uh, issue with a friend of mine who is a bioinformaticist. Uh, he worked in the biomedical field, and now he's he was working for Big Pharma doing bioinformatics. Um, it's really difficult. You're, it's like comparing apples and oranges. So if Jeffrey Tompkins is correct, though, then it is abjectly the opposite of comparing apples and oranges. Comparing two things within a kind is like comparing apples and apples. And comparing apples to oranges should be reserved for comparing things from two different kinds. But I don't think he got the question because he goes on to say this. So when if you're... <laughs> If you were to look at, say, humans and rabbits or humans and rats or whatever, you've got different chromosome numbers, different chromosome structures, different gene neighborhood structures. So gene neighborhoods are very interesting. Uh, that's the, basically the, the content of genes within a, a large section of a chromosome. Uh, it's, it's almost impossible, really, uh, to compare you know, stuff that is is so dissimilar. But that's not how it should be if they're within the same kind, because Jeff is perfectly fine comparing humans to humans, which he thinks those are both within the same kind. And he's fine even comparing humans and chimps, which, according to him, are not. So why can't you compare organisms that are more distant? But again, that wasn't the question. The question is, does he have any predictions with regard to the percent similarity between two things that he thinks are within the same kind, like cats and lions, or rats and mice. Um, it, we we did make an attempt at it, but and we tried to, to create these coefficients of, of similarity statistically, uh, but it was it it was just too difficult to to really get to the bottom uh, uh, to the bottom of that. They tried it, but it was too difficult. That's weird, because I tried it and it was super easy. Now, in all seriousness, I think what's going on here is that wires are getting crossed. Jeff thought that the question was asking, how do you compare organisms with different chromosome numbers, which can be really difficult because of how genetic material gets switched around. But the question was, how do you compare organisms that are within the same kind that do have the same chromosome number, whose genomes are fully available on things like Ensemble? Now, to me, it seems pretty impossible that Jeffrey Tompkins found it to be very difficult to compare organisms with different chromosome numbers without first having attempted comparing organisms with the same chromosome number. So I am left to believe that he has, in fact, in my opinion, compared organisms that should be within the same kind that have the same chromosome number and unfortunately did not get the answer that he wanted. I don't know that to be the case, but again, it sounds to me like he's at least worked with the genomes of other organisms here, and the fact that he's never published anything on their percent similarity using his methods is concerning. Okay, this question is from Joel Duff. He asks, from a young Earth perspective, can we make a testable prediction about what the genetic similarity would be between a wolf and a gray fox or a cheetah and a lion using your methodology? That's an interesting question. I guess that would be a fun, uh, fun project to, to do that. That's interesting. Yeah. I, I don't know that we have really good quality genomes for these creatures. Um, we do, we definitely do for dogs and, and wolves. Uh, a lot of research has been done there in DNA sequencing. Um, and with cats, I know that there's been some, some work done there as well, but yeah, that's that's interesting. That would be a fun, a fun project, but it it would all be based on the overall quality of the genomes, how complete they were. Uh, but but that's a great question. Okay, though, do you see how weird this entire interview is with these questions? Because the last question asked made me think that he was doing these comparative genomics between organisms with pretty different genomes to the extent that they have different chromosome numbers. In fact, he said he tried to do it. But then now, he sounds like he's never even considered 
comparing organisms that are within the same kind that have the same size genome or similar size genome with at least the same number of chromosomes. That is very, very impeccably strange, isn't it? But at the same time, what do you do with that information? Like, is Tompkins being dishonest and he was being honest about the previous comparison and he actually has compared dogs and wolves, but he just hasn't published the results because it'll show that they, using his methods, are about as similar as humans and chimps are, proving that his methods don't work? Or is he kind of incompetent and genuinely hasn't considered comparing two other organisms that should be within the same kind using his methods? It just doesn't make any sense. This is our final anonymous question. And then after that, we're going to close. So this is, um, here's the question. A well-known creation scientist, Dr. Marcus Ross, has stated in a recent interview on YouTube that your estimate of 80% or 84% uh, chimp human DNA identity is inaccurate and should be closer to 94% because your analysis counted all differences equally, including duplications and insertions, and does not account for genome size differences. Is it true that if you account for these things, your estimate would be closer to 94%? So just a quick note here, I'm like 99% sure that the anonymous question asker is just Donnie of Standing for Truth again. And the reason I say that is because I know Donnie was wanting to keep tabs on this thing. He wanted to make sure that it went well. It did not. And he had to skedaddle off to a debate, which is why he left like really early into this interview. I also happen to know that Donnie and Roop are friends and that they communicate frequently and collaborate on blog posts together. So Donnie, I'm on to you. I would bet dollars to donuts that it was your smug little self sending these anonymous questions. Anyways, it doesn't really matter because we exactly replicated Tomkins' methods with other organisms as controls and we showed that his methods do not work, be they the uh, 2015 and earlier or 2018 plus. This is uh, from Gusick Gibbon. She says, one last question. If there is time, Dr. Tompkins, is there a reason why you switched your methods from ungapped and weighted to gapped and unweighted from 2015 onward? Yeah, I wanted to uh, include the, uh, make the alignments longer. Uh, when evolutionists first began comparing human and chimp DNA, they actually uh, did not gap the algorithm. <laughs> Algor the algorithm itself has been improving uh, significantly over time, especially, like I said, since I first began using it. And, uh, and actually, the algorithm was improved based on my own complaints and interaction with the NIH and sending them data and, you know, from my analyses and convincing them that they needed to fix it. But so the algorithm has improved over time uh, where I could include uh, better alignment uh, features in it, in increase the, the length of the alignments by, by, you know, allowing for very liberal gapping. But the algorithm's limited, you know, once it hits a gap that's, that's so different or so big that it can't get through, it, it breaks off the alignment. So. So my understanding is that ungapped was used extremely early in the comparisons between humans and chimpanzees and that it was acceptable at the time because they were comparing protein coding regions and proteins tend to be highly conserved between organisms. Still, I don't think they would do that now. And in fact, using ungapped for any two different species and even two members of the same species, if the regions of the genome being compared are too different, gapped is recommended. So the logic here is sound. He's saying earlier on we were using shorter sequences, but I wanted to use longer contiguous sequences, and so the switch from ungapped to gapped was merited. Except he was using, like, long contigs pretty early on in his sort of series of papers on this topic. In fact, he did the entire genome, or at least enormous portions of the genome, back in 2013 and then in 2015. So ungapped was not appropriate then either, and he seems to understand where it is and isn't appropriate, so I don't understand why he used ungapped ever at all, except, again, kind of calling back to this original methodology back before we knew too much about using BLAST or even comparative genomics in general. Now, the second thing that's weird here is he talks about how he switches to using gaps, but it's okay um, because he used really liberal gapping parameters. And none of that matters because, again, he doesn't weight his sequences. So, like, it goes from being a more understandable genetics mistake through time to being 
a worse mistake because it's something that like a middle schooler would understand. So I'm just trying to improve uh, my research over time, I guess would be the answer to that question and, <laughs> and increase my, you know, alignment, the, the alignment capabilities of the tools I'm using, because I want to get to the bottom of it as much as anyone does. So, yeah. Go to the comments now and tell me, do you believe him? Yeah, it's just been a long process, a long haul. And, you know, basically what I've shared tonight is 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 the most up to date uh, assessment that I can give you at this point. So, you know, maybe in the future I can I can have even more data to share, hopefully so. Well, Dr. Tompkins, you've done some great research over the years. We're so grateful for your contribution. And uh, we're about more than 15 minutes over. So The most up-to-date personal research he seemed to show in this video, at least with regard to the human chimp genome similarity, was from 2018. And as you saw earlier, and as we've talked about today, um, the field has advanced quite a bit in the past five years, in the past half decade. To say nothing of the fact that his methods were never appropriate to begin with. So that ends my little inserted portion here. Let's get back to your regularly scheduled conclusion. My gentle and of course very modern apes, thank you so much for being with me here today. This one took a lot of work, so I really appreciate you guys sticking around through my nonsense arc in order to see some of the bigger projects that I have to offer. And indeed, I've got two more at least that are very close to being released. They're, they're down they're down the pipeline, they're on the way. Uh, but in the meantime, if you like what I do, you can like, comment, and subscribe as your free way to support me. And if you wanna support me in other ways, you can join my Patreon where you get sometimes early access to videos and every time you get your little name at the end when the credits roll to my little animation and to uh, Brock Berrigan's really cool song, Point Pleasant. I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope that you will now go forward into the world wielding the knowledge that humans and chimpanzees really are 96 to 98.8 percent similar and that that 80 percent number is complete and utter bogus. And my promise to you is that no matter how long Jeffrey Tompkins stays on this subject, I am now like a hound with a scent. I will not ever stop correcting Jeffrey Tompkins' mistakes on his genetics work. I don't care how many experts I have to contact. I don't care how long it takes me to run the analysis. I will make sure that I peer review him forever. And I'm sure my biologically inclined viewers would also like to give you their thoughts, their free peer review. So folks, if you would like to give Jeffrey Tompkins, whose email is public, uh, your thoughts, you can do so by shooting him a message here. Do not harass Jeffrey Tompkins. This is me encouraging you as my audience to give him your professionally worded, appropriate, and civil thoughts on his work, not heckle him. The former is supposed to be welcomed at Answers in Genesis and ICR, so I don't think that will be a problem, will it? You can feel free to send him my video or just ask him any questions that you have about his work after having seen most of it, with regard to this topic at least. And so, my gentle and of course very modern apes, please do take care of yourselves and I will see you next time.